Hi everyone, um, I am Jennifer Shahadi. I'm the resident teacher here at the club for last week and this week, and I'm gonna be leaving unfortunately on Friday, but uh, it's been my pleasure to give lectures. This one is kind of a continuation of what I did last lecture since many of the same um, students attend both. Um, we talked about a Pillsbury game, and if, the, if you're watching on YouTube, you might wanna check that lecture out first. And we also talked a little bit about the queen within across the street at the World Chess Hall of Fame, and the relationship between beauty in art and clothing and beauty in chess. And I was talking about this dress, which is really one of the highlight pieces across the street. It's a Victor and Wolf dress. There's a, I think Katy Perry wore it. And it's, you know, absolutely like stunning when you go to the exhibit. This is um, an installation photo actually. And what I was saying was that the fact is, it's amazing that the dress looks relatively simple, and yet somehow it also has these holes in it, and it's completely um, perfect otherwise. And how in chess problems, there is a theory that if there's extraneous things in the position that don't have anything to do with the solution, like just some pawns or rooks or something random that could easily be taken off, it's an inferior problem, right? So that, that reminded me of the idea that if there was extra things inside this dress, that would be inferior. It wouldn't be as, as beautiful, even if you couldn't see it right away. Now, let's take a look at one position that I've always kind of liked. Well, I've liked it since I've seen it, which is generally the idea with studies and problems. Um, last time we went over one of the most beautiful, simple positions, I think, in chess, the famous ready pawn end game. Here we've got something that's a little bit more complicated, but it's still very few pieces on the board. And so you, you can imagine it coming from a real game, although it's certainly a little bit odder, because how did this, uh, this rook get here exactly? But that's not what we're looking at. We're not looking at retrograde analysis, as, as they call it. We're just looking for the best move here for white. So white to move and win. Um, not yet. I do, this, is, this is like so cool. I want to give people a chance to see it. Definitely longer than a few seconds. You want to write it down or something, Julian? Make sure you have it. Julian, you can write it down. Yeah, no, not don't help him. Here, here's, here's like an old score sheet and some pen. You can write it down if you want. This is pretty hard. I mean, um, this is unless you've seen it before, it's like pretty tough to find this instantly. I'd say, especially all the variations. There's a couple. There's a couple lines. I know a lot of people want to try rook takes rook, and then after king takes, you want to try rook f1 check, and then after king to g8. King e7, king e7 th threading. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's form a consensus. Can I see your, your answer? Okay, so what, do we want to play king e7, or do we want to play h6? What do we, I've heard both in moves. If, if king e7, he just Exactly, exactly, and that's not, and the, that's not winning, because <laughs> obviously this pawn, and that's, that's an example, like these, these pieces are needed, right, because otherwise, if you didn't have these pieces on the board, otherwise you could just do something like this and be winning, right, so they're, they're, it's important to have something in the board. So instead you want to play h6, okay, and, oops, sorry, instead of king e7, right, now if I take? 
Okay, so what's your threat? You're threatening. You were, you were, you were threatening rook g1 followed by king f7. Is that what you're saying? Okay. So what do you think I should play as black? B2. Well, if, B, if I play b2 here, then you're just going to follow through with your plan, right? And after a rook g1 check, king h8, king here, um, yeah, you can't stop me. Well, if king g7... Sorry. If king g7, same thing, right? So h5. Yeah, that's the problem. So if h5, oh, sorry, I keep doing things in the wrong order. If h5, now if rook g1 check, king here, here, it's not mate, right? Because what can black play? Now black can play h6. And now this is not mate. It's a draw. So, we can look, like, let's see, so I think it's, sh so you're saying you want to just try to, like, pick up the pawns, but I mean, no, it work first a knight with those pawns should be a draw unless you have, like, a mate or something, right? So, Sean's wondering about just playing rook over here and trying to pick up this pawn and see, but... Yeah, I mean, this should be okay for black. We can't hold on to the pawn, unfortunately, but we can just play here. I don't, I don't see why this should be winning, these two pawns, right? So instead, that might give you some ideas, though, that whole variation. That's the thing about chess and problems especially, but even like a regular checkmating attack, when you look at incorrect variations, a lot of the time, they hold within them the solution, right? Do you really have it? We're going to think a little longer? Not rook g7, no. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't, want, well, it doesn't quite do it. Um, if rook h8, rook takes h8. And then what, rook what? Rook F8? I mean, F1. F1, and then where's black has to go? Uh, king to uh, uh, G8. And then what should white do? King to E7. E then I have H6. <laughs> I have pawn to H6. <laughs> so maybe you should play H6. Uh-huh, move order. Exactly, and this is why even though these things, people complain that they're impractical, that studies and problems never occur in real games, I mean, these are exactly the types of uh, variations and ideas that we need to improve on. Move order, right? Julian called it out. Rook h8. Rook takes h8. Well, because now we're, of course, friending rook to f1, right? Because that's also b2 would just lead to mate after rook f1. So it kind of has to take. And now we play rook f1 check, forcing king g8. And instead of king e7, which allows h6, which we kind of saw before, h6. we play h6. And this is just a fabulous move, right? I mean, just shutting everything in inside. And now, after after takes an h6, now white plays king e7, and it is actually forced mate, right? We're playing rook to g1, and there's there's no way there's no way out. So pretty cool problem. Okay. They, this is just a random example where exactly the same variation works, but it's supposedly not as good because these pawns just have nothing to do with the position. So they don't add anything to it, right? It's the same exact solution. And it still works. The pawns don't affect the solution, but it's not considered by problemists to be as beautiful. Now, of course, this doesn't really mean much when, when you're just thinking about competitive chess. But to the person who's actually making the problem, this all matters. And then there are actually problem competitions where the problems are rated. And that's where factors like this come into play, that every piece should have some kind of role. So there's a difference, even though problems and studies are useful for your chess training, they also have a world attached to them that have values that are separated from chess tournaments and just trying to win, right? The most similar thing would be best game competitions where you do have that same kind of spirit of 
just judging something by on its, on its aesthetics, not how it makes you better at chess. Yeah? What do they mean when they say a problem's cooked? A problem's cooked, well that's a good question. A, a cooked problem means a problem that has multiple solutions. And that's also considered very bad. So that means, like, even when I showed the Pillsbury game last class, it's like it would be hard to put that in a tactics book, bishop takes h6, because as Julian pointed out, knight takes f7 is also pretty good. So it's, it's like a problem when you have, it's a problem. It's, un, it's, not as, it's not as good for publishing when you have these multiple solutions because it's a bit frustrating for the, the reader. I mean, I'm sure all of you have experienced this when looking at old tactics books or even the databases on chess tempo and chess.com and game not, that there's sometimes problems where there are, or puzzles rather, they're called puzzles when they come from real games and problems when they're composed. Uh, puzzles, there are puzzles where you know, you find a move that wins a queen and they wanted you to find another move that wins a queen, right? You've, you've all experienced that, right? And so that's another example of cooked. Um, of course, in the case of puzzles, it's not really a big deal because you're just really training, whereas in a problem, it's considered to be a serious deficiency. But one that I think a lot of people would have trouble arguing with, I will show you now. You know, some of you are going to recognize this position, unfortunately. Those of you who don't, I'm um, sorry. Um, those of you who don't are lucky because you've never seen it before. Yeah, like how many people recognize this position? This is just one of the most, I talk about the ready position being one of the most fantastic interests. I mean, this one is just like right up there because it, there's so few pieces on the board, right? To each, just like the ready position. We had one pawn for each side and, and lone kings, and yet the, the magic of the solution is so surprising. So surprising. How many people do recognize this position? Probably Julia does. I'm sure Sean does. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I've seen You don't remember? I don't want you to tell me the whole answer right now. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this is uh, this is white to, white to move, yeah. But I, I'll give you the first move for white because it's kind of obvious. What's that? Yeah, well, it's kind of weird because I want you to like solve it for both sides in a way. I want you to like try to find the draw for black. So black to move and attempt to draw, and then you also I want you to like basically look at it for both sides, which is of course what you do when you play a chess game as well. And that's what a lot of people have trouble with. They have a lot more difficulty finding brilliant moves for their opponent than they do for themselves. I'd say people are you know, probably a couple hundred points lower rated at finding brilliancies for their opponent. Just because, first of all, it's one move back, right? So you're already dealing with like one half a move less of horizon. And then on top of that, you're looking at the position from your point of view all game. Wow, that's cool. Some of you guys don't recognize this. This is such a great position. So this black's basically trying to draw, right? The queen, the pawn's about to queen. Black wants to draw. As we know, queen versus rook. Computers might be able to draw it against uh, against a human who's like you know not like. Apparently, it's very difficult. You have to be really strong to beat a computer. I've never tried it, but computers are very good at defending a rook versus a queen. But I mean, humans are just always losing very quickly because it's hard to get the, it, it's, it's really weird like the computer finds like the exact place to put the rook where you don't have um, a check followed by a check winning the rook and for, for humans it's very hard to defend against the queen. So you can assume when you get to the end of the variation, what I'm saying is when you get to the end of a variation and you have a queen versus a rook, you can just assume you win. What's that? Oh, you want to play rook d2 here. Well, the problem with that is that I'm going to move up the board and then I'm going to stop. Like, oh, you, you yeah, exactly. Oh, you don't let me get that other so yeah, I'm going to play queen. Yeah, I'm not going to come to the c file. Oh, okay. Until until it's like here. I'll be darned. Yeah, and then we have what, what I was talking about, where you can you can you can hold on for a little while, but eventually you're going to lose contact right. and lose lose contact with your your king and your rook. Yeah. So black has a better drawing attempt, a much better drawing attempt. Yeah, rook d6 check is certainly a better drawing attempt. And that, now try to analyze that a little bit on your own. So 
Do you ever seen this, Julian? Ah, okay. You probably remember it closer to the time. Um. Oh, okay. You're looking at it from white. Yeah. Well, the thing is, if you play King c5, then black does have like a kind of nice resource, right? If if black plays rook to d6 check and white plays King c5, what will black play? Yeah, rook to d1, and now our idea is that if you queen, we get that skewer in with, with rook c1. So now you're going to have to actually, actually uh, grovel back and get that draw with king, king b6, right? So instead of rook d6 check, king c5, um, how do you play for a win with white? Of course, king b7 is not good, right? If rook d6 check, king b7, what would black play? D7. Just rook d7 instant draw, right? So instead, white's attempt to win would be what? King b5, that's right. And then what would, what would black do? Got it. And then king c4 would lead to the same fate as before, all right? So instead, white plays what? This is one that we like to do in our heads because... Uh, Rook d5 check, and then we're looking at white's next move. Yeah, sure, keep going, right? You've got a goal here, right? I, I think your goal is starting to become apparent, right? Yeah, exactly. So after king b4, black plays what? In order to try to keep doing this. Rook d4 check, got it, and then white plays what? And then rook d3 check, and then what does white play? And now it looks like bad news, right? Because we can no longer check and we can no longer go, we don't, we don't have a zero square to go to. Rook to d0, that would be a good move, so that if you queen we still score you. But since that's not allowed, black's last attempt to draw the game is what? What's black's super good move? And this is why you know, it's hard to, you have to be able to see your opponent's good plans as well. Black has a really great try here to try to get a draw, and then white has an amazing counter try. So you see, you guys visualize that position, right? Where we got our rook, back, rook down on d3, and the king's gotten, gotten to c2. And now, what do we do to try to draw? It looks like the white pawn is going to queen, and we're just going to be left with a rook versus a queen, and we're going to lose. So do we have any, um, any kind of saving tries here? Rook d4. Rook d4. Okay, let's see if somebody else can see the point of that. Now, if white were to make a queen, what does black do? <coughs> exactly. Very good. So let's, uh, let's see. So instead, what's the hole there? What can white do instead? I'll go over this on the board in a second, too, but I just want everybody to try to visualize, because this is the advanced class, and visualizing eight moves ahead is in such an empty position where there's not very much going on should be doable. Yes, sir, Sarah, showed this to us out on the side. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is... Yeah, I mean, this is just an amazing position. It's, just, it, it's incredible that it exists with so few pieces on the board. It's just, uh, I mean, uh, this is just crazy. You guys know what? Do you guys see what the solution is for white in that position? So after rook d4, white has a super move, superb move. There you go. Right. Exactly. So let's take a look at that on the board. So this is all for us, and then a rook d4, brilliant try. So that if queen, rook c4 creates a stalemate. And now we make our little rook and we are threatening checkmate. Well, mate in two. So black's only defense. Rook to a4 and then the uh, coup de gras. 
king b3, and that's another double attack. We've seen a lot of, it's funny, like I talked about how the ready position is in essence a double attacking position. This is also a very cool finale double attack where the white king is attacking the rook on a4, and we're also threatening checkmate. So you're going to have to give up the rook or get mated. Bam. <coughs> Yeah, I know. This is a really a crazy position. I think this one's even better than the ready position. It's got to be one of the coolest, coolest like position with just two pieces on the board. Crazy. So this, the beauty of simplicity here, really um, uh, just fantastic. And it's nice that you get to see another piece on the board as well. Great position. Mm, let's look at this one. This one is a little harder. White to move and win. Yes. So as you, you'll, you'll see, uh, we talked earlier about distraction in the other class. So, so if works C2, basically your idea is that if you're trying to distract me from the, you're trying to distract me from the, uh, the, the D8 square, right? So that's your idea? But the problem is at the end of that variation, after bishop D8 check, G5, and now the pawn on G2 is pinned. Otherwise, it would just be made a one. But is that, the, is that the end of the story? I guess I'll start over here. I'll make you guys figure it out from here. You guys have this book. This is a great book. I mean, it's mostly just regular end games, but there's plenty of uh, studies sprinkled in. That's the Dobaretsky Endgame Manual. Most of Dobaretsky's books are really like quite difficult, but this one, like, there's really a lot for everybody. I mean, like, some of his books are really, I think, they're geared for like 2,400 plus, literally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not. I mean, this one though, though, this one, like, there's really like, there's the, the, he goes through a lot of stuff, and he's even got sections where he talks about. There, he's got sections where he talks about. Um, things and they're outlined in blue and that's like the really, really essential stuff. And then he goes over like the more advanced permutations after the text in blue. Kind of similar to what, you know, Jeremy Silman has an endgame book as well, which does something similar, which kind of splits it up by rating. I don't know if anybody has that book. That's also really cool. You have that one? Yeah. That was your first check book, chess book? Yeah, and reassess your chest is really good too. Really good. Yeah. So, this is what we call a domination study. There's a famous composer, Kasparian, who I think uh, one of your other uh, teachers, frequent teachers, Grandmaster Veruja Nakobian, is a huge fan of. Kasparian, an Armenian hero who made. Uh, Plenty of uh, beautiful endgame compositions. He has a book full of them. How many are in that? Like thousands, right? Two thousand, yeah, four hundred. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, rook c2 is correct. And after queen takes c2, we, we, we just need to find the, the right move now. After bishop d8 check, g5. Well, bishop c7, the queen can capture. But you got, you're on the right path. The right path. <laughs> Not bishop e7. You actually have a move which threatens something directly. Even in studies, that can be good. <laughs> well, yes, because bishop a5 threatens mate, right? We're made into. So well, black actually must stop it. Well, he could play queen f2. The other way to stop it would be what g4, but that would lead to what? Then bishop d8 is just mate, right? So you have, to, you have to use the queen to protect the e1 square while making sure not to allow g3, right? <laughs> so you only got two options. So let's say queen e2. And now what? Um, 
Now bishop c7. Bishop e1. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah because it, it, if you play bishop e1, then queen takes e1 allows g3, right? So now, again, if g4, what happens? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So, so what, uh, what does black have to do here? This black's only move, really, that keeps things going. Yeah, queen f2. And now, and now what does white do? So if bishop d6, now what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now what can black do? So basically, if he moves the queen along on this, th on this file, I'm sorry, rank, if he moves the queen in the rank, bishop g3 is made. If he moves the queen away from the rank, g3 is made. Yeah. So it's just an like incredible position, right? Or black's basically in zugzwang and this bishop is actually stronger than the queen, but black still has a better defensive try than just just getting mated. What's his best What's his best little defensive try here? Yes, queen to f4 check. That's what you meant, right? And now, now what? <laughs> and now you better not take here after all that work. After all that brilliant work, you better play the right move here. G3, of course. Yeah. That's a pretty cool position, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we should get the final position on the board. Very nice, very nice. So speaking of cooks, let's talk briefly about what would happen. Um, what was the other suggestion? I think after, in this position, we talked about bishop b8 quickly. Exactly. And now there's no bishop d8 mating. Oh. So it's never as good. After um, and before bishop d8, uh, isn't bishop d6 the only way you move? Well, yeah, I mean, you don't really have a lot of other moves. You, oh, you're, because this one, because this one would be your other try, but there's also g4. Yeah, yeah so same thing. Yeah, and again, uh, obviously, it makes the problem superior. Yeah. Yeah, very cool one. Now I've got some other, some other good ones. Well, last time. I showed, I showed how like we were all looking at simple positions, and it's a bit of a thing where people are always talking about how in chess problems and studies, a lot of people like to like the ones that are simpler, like the Saavedra problem, which is the rook and pawn one, and the ready problem. It's very aesthetic to chess players because you see the pure power of a piece. But there's also been something to be said for like the really crazy ones, like the maiden one we looked at last class. And of course, there's some pretty wild fashions across the street as well, like this a really incredible installation by Hideki, um, which is on the first floor, where it's like, wow, somebody can wear that? That is, this is an installation across the street at the World Chess Hall of Fame. It's one of the archetypes of the queen. This is the explorer. And basically, there are nine like mini art installations to represent all the different archetypes of the queen. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's really just, uh, even if you don't like normally art and fashion, it's very, very much worth a look. This is by the famous composer Sam Lloyd. He won competitions year after year after year, right? I mean, it was like... Yeah. And this one, I also wanted to show because it's like, It's in this. It, it's in this crazy shape, also, right? Oh, wow. He he wanted to make the position in a shape, and he had a really good quote about this position. Actually, I I found this in one of my. Um, I'm gonna put this over here. Actually, I'll, I'll read it off my phone. Yeah. It's actually white to play and black to play. So there's a there's a winning move for both sides. Yeah. And what he said really reminded me because you know last time I was talking about how in chess problems there's either like the problem which is really really weird looking which ends up looking kind of simple when you get the answer 
And then there's also the really, really simple looking problem, which ends up being super deep and complicated when you get the answer. And if you think about that, that's a lot of what the two extremes of beauty are in other fields too, right? Like something extremely minimalistic, which is a lot deeper, or something which is really crazy and clashing, but somehow everything works despite that, right? So we see that in a, a lot of different fields. Wait, let me try to pull up that quote. OK. This problem um, by Lloyd is called a wheel within a wheel. Because as you see, there's a wheel, and then there's another wheel. And it's white to, white to move and in, made into, black to move and made into. And Lloyd said about the problem that he was attempting to show the most absurd position he could think of, fettered by the conditions of producing four problems in the one diagram. They're also self-made, which we're not going to get into. <laughs> Although I do sometimes try to, uh, sometimes it's fun to have people try to figure out the worst move. Okay, what's white me? You want me to say it? Yeah, sure. Queen takes, uh, yeah, H3. Excellent. That's right. And then after king takes? King G5. Very good. That's a really weird looking mate, right? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> nice. And I think I have the, uh, the black one loaded separately. It looks exactly the same. So what's the answer? And then after king e4? So what happens here? Rook takes bishop. Yeah, I have to. The white one's better than the black one in this in this case, right? I mean, the 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 black one, but it's just amazing that it can works for both sides in this crazy position. And can you imagine somebody just decided to wake up one morning and uh, <laughs> and like make a position of a wheel between in, be, behind a wheel with a maiden one, with a maiden two, a maiden two, and two self mates? That's insane. What a genius, right? Pretty cool. Yeah. This one I like. This is white to move and win. This one's like, this one I was thinking about showing the last class. It's not the hardest one, but it's just really cool. Um, try it, give, let's give everybody a minute. Okay, this one, again, because it's very simple, so that's why I like this one. I mean, it's simple, it's not that easy to see, but it's so simplified, there's so few pieces on the board. A miniature, as they call it. In chess, competitive chess, we call in miniature a game that ends very quickly. Yeah. Is, that, is it 25 moves? OK. And then in problems, it's ones with uh, fewer than five pieces, right? Fewer than seven. Fewer than seven, OK. Seven, including kings? Yeah. Oh, that, that, so it's five. Five pieces other than the king. Yeah, OK. It is bishop a7, and then and then what's your anybody got a full you got a full variation for me? If bishop a7, what do you think black plays? Bishop c3. Bishop c3, then what would you play? Bishop a1. And then after bishop a1. Then I would play. Uh, um, king d, king d3, king d3. No. Not king d3 because then e4 check and we um covering the diagonal again. So 
So bishop a7, where are we now? Bishop a7, bishop c3, king c2, bishop a1, right? That's where you guys are. Again, king to d3 was suggested, but then e4 check stops, start, re uh, allows the bishop to, to guard that diagonal. Reopens, yeah. Not bishop c5. Again, we would try to play e4. Yeah, but I'm guarding the whole diagonal now, and I'm going to get my king back in. Yeah? I think somebody called it out earlier, actually. Probably just didn't see the finale. Oh, just H7? No. no, again, we got the E4 coming in. Okay. We're at bishop, if bishop A7. So you obviously can't take because then H7 and H8 equals queen. So you play bishop c3, king c2, bishop a1. And now it's white to move. You can put it on the board, although it will be easier. See, so you see it as soon as I put the pieces on the board. Good job. And now if pawn takes d4, what happens? Then king d3. Nice. And then we're just playing queen. And if bishop d4, then the same. Well, if bishop d4 is not the same because of h7, e4, right? So if bishop d4, we play what? King d3, exactly. Very good. And now if we play... What's that? If e4 check now, instead of taking on e4, we have king takes bishop, right? And now if king g5... h7... And after king g6, queen, e4 check, we have king takes d4 again, right? So that's a little cool problem. Yeah, so a simple one, but really nice. Yeah, so you really see the total diversity here in chess problems. The very simple problem, miniature, as we call it, with uh, five majors, with five, rather five pieces, whether pawns or, or major pieces or minor pieces, and two kings from just basically an infinite number of pieces. You don't even know where they came from. Five light squared bishops, all that. So the absolute uh, polar opposites, but both really train the same exact skills, getting better at calculating. Mm -hmm.